Okay, we're going to start at chapter 15. Now, th- several of these verses, I'm going to go real quick through them, because it's just <laughs> repeating what we've already learned. But in chapter 15, Eliphaz is still saying the same thing, that he is wicked. People like Job don't prosper. And he's still calling Job a hypocrite. Because Job is complaining. I mean, Job is claiming to be a Christian. He loves the Lord. But they're calling him a hypocrite. That he can't be, he can't love the Lord because everything he's going through, he's got to be a wicked man. This is what his three friends are doing. And they just continue to do it. Chapter 16, Job tells Eliphaz that they came to comfort him, but they did a miserable job. He said, y'all came to comfort me, but y'all have done a miserable job at it. Job also says that if I was in your shoes, I would do everything that I could to help you in your time of grief. He's saying, he's telling them, I wouldn't go about this the way y'all are going about it. If I was in y'all shoes, I would be trying to help the brother. But instead, y'all just keep condemning me. Job, Job also believed that God, he believed God hates him at this time. In verse 11, Job says, God hath delivered me to the ungodly and turned me over into the hands of the wicked. And at the end of the, at the book, we're going to find where his three friends are going to get saved. That's why I say these are not Christians. These three men who, come, who supposedly came to comfort Job, one, they didn't, and two, they were lost, but they get saved. We'll get to that. Because through 16 chapters so far, and, and others, we're finding these men did a terrible job at coming to comfort Job. And then at the end of chapter 16, he starts again on God. He starts complaining to the Lord again, just like he's been doing. And in chapter 17, he continues to complain, and that he's not going to live much longer, which he said that before in another chapter. And he's also saying in chapter 17, he talks about how his good days are behind him. And then in chapter 18, Bildad, the other friend, the second friend, replies to Job and says, you think you're, talk- you think you're talking to animals. You think we're dumb and stupid. Which, if I was Job, I would have said, yeah, that's what I think. But in Bildad is still calling him wicked in chapter 18. In chapter 19, Job is telling them that if he was wrong, they, would, they should be able to show him where he was wrong. But they, didn't, they couldn't show him. All they, all they could do was accuse him of sin, of being wicked. But they couldn't show him. He says, you have so much wisdom, then show me where I'm guilty. If you're so wise, show me where I'm guilty. This is what Job is telling them. Well, they couldn't do it. And Job, he speaks about how, he's, how everybody has turned against him. And they have. And in, in verse 23... He, he gets one of his wishes, because in verse 23 he says, Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. Well, guess what? Yeah. They were. <laughs> he, this is what he wished. This is what he asked. And it's what happened. We have a book of Job. It was written. Now, Job, like I said, he's up and down on a lot of things he's complaining about. Some things he's complaining about, it's off. That's not the way the Lord is. But then there are some things he say that are very true about the Lord. In verse 25, it says, For I know that my Deemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Job knows, he knows he has a Redeemer. Remember, the Old Testament, all of the Old Testament, points to Jesus. You can take every book in the Old Testament, and in some type of way, it points to Jesus about a Redeemer, about the Messiah, the Son of God coming. So he knew that there was a Redeemer. And he knew also that this Redeemer in the latter days would show upon the earth again. That's what he says right here. And that he shall stand at the latter days upon the earth. Job already knew. How could he say this? Did he read Revelations? They didn't have Revelation back then. In verse 26... And though after my skin worms destroyed his body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Job knew a lot more than what his friends thought he knew. He knew that his body would go to the grave and the worms would probably eat eat it up. Okay, he knew that. But he also knew that he would get a new body. He knew this already. In verse 27, 
whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall be whole, and not another, though my ruins be consumed within me. He's saying, praise God, we're going to see the Lord. No matter what happens to our bodies, he says, we are going to see the Lord. All right, that's what he's saying in verse 27. Now we're going to jump to chapter 20. In chapter 20, pretty much what's so far, this is his third friend. So far is just like the other two friends. And then chapter 21, Joe replies to him, and he still complains to God. And he tells so far, he says, I'm not complaining to man. I'm complaining to the Lord. I'm complaining to God. And that's what he says through chapter 21. So chapter 22, Eliphaz is still accusing Job of being wicked. Now, all the way in chapter 22, they're still accusing him of being wicked. And in verse 20, he says, We haven't lost all of our substance, but you have. So Eliphaz is saying, Hey, look at us. We haven't lost everything we had, but look at you. You have. So what's he telling them here? You're a wicked guy. If you, if you don't have everything like we do, then you must be a wicked guy. That's what they're saying right here. He's saying if you don't have great wealth, you're not right with God. We have those, te- we have those teachings today. We have preachers who preach that if you're not wealthy, you're not walking with the Lord. You're not right with God. And this is what wolves tell you. You, if you're right with God, you can have anything you want. But what did they do with uh, John the Baptist? He was about as, as he was about as close as you can get to a man of God than anyone. And what did he have? He lived in the wilderness. What did they What did they say about John? What did they say about him? And this was a man of God. So I don't know what they do with these things. Chapter twenty three, Job replies. He's still complaining, and he replies. But then in verse 10 through 12, he does speak the truth about the Lord. He knows the words of God. He says that God knows everything about him. When he has examined me, he'll know that I'm innocent. That's what Job is saying. My foot hath held his steps. Now, Job got that from Psalms 37, 23. Because Psalms 37 23 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. That's what the Lord says. So if you're a righteous man, are you walking in your own footsteps? Are you going in the path you want to go? Or are you going in the steps that are ordered by the Lord? That's a question for you to answer. Am I walking in the way God wants me to go? Or am I walking the way I want to go? Am I pursuing my wants or am I pursuing God's wants? But that's what Job is saying. My foot has held his steps, referring to to Psalms 37. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. When you're walking with the Lord, he orders your footsteps. What he's saying also is he's done God's will. He's doing God's will or he's done God's will. He's not too much in God's will right now with all the complaining he's doing. But up until now... He's been in God's will. He was a godly man. He lives by the words of God more than food is what he says. And in the New Testament it says that. And I've, I've taught you all this before. Matthew 4.4 4, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So just like I've told you all before, what's more important? Feeding yourself physical food for your body or feeding yourself the word of God? I mean, they're both important, but which one's going to get you to heaven? The Lord. The Word of God is going to get you to heaven. The words of God, if you obey Him, you will live forever. But if you put the words of God aside and you're filling yourself on just physical food for your body, that's not going to live forever. So right here, Matthew says, man cannot live by... Re- you can't just live by eating your, 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 your food. It says... But you live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. This is the mouth of God right here. The Bible is the mouth of God. Guess what? You're not going to have any power over the devil. Because you don't know what God's word says. He tells you what power you have. But if you don't know it, if you don't read it, how can you use it? But if you're spiritually fed, then you will have strength to fight against the devil, his demons, and your own Way, remember, we're born 
in sin. It's just natural for us to sin. Like I said before, when two sinners have a baby, the baby's a sinner. So that's what we are. We're sinners. And that's, that's what we do. So we have to learn when we're born again, okay, Lord, how do I live? That's why it's called born again. Because you learn a different new way of living. Everything that you've been taught has been by the world. But now you're being taught by the Holy Spirit on how to live. And then after he says that, Job goes back to complaining to the Lord again. Like I said, Job is up and down. He's praising God one time and then he's complaining to him. Chapter 24. He's still complaining in chapter 24. That God doesn't listen to him. He says that the wicked take advantage of the poor. And they do their evilness at night. But they will get what they deserve. That's what he's saying in chapter 24. They will get what... You know that the wicked, the evil, you know they are going to get what they deserve, right? They will get it. We might look at it now that they're getting away with a lot of stuff. But their time is coming. And like I said before, this is not, a, this is not something we should be happy about. Because we shouldn't wish anybody to go to hell. Chapter 25. Bildad doesn't attack Job anymore. And he just speaks about how powerful God is in, in chapter 25. And in verse 2, he says, Dominion and fear are within. He maketh peace in his high places. He's talking about heaven and how God has kicked the fallen angels out. Okay, dominion and fear are with him. He maketh peace in high places. You know, they had to have peace in heaven. But when Satan wanted to take over, when he wanted to be God himself... What happened? There's no longer peace in heaven. So what did, what did God have to do? To have peace in heaven, what did he have to do? He kicked the devil out and those who wanted to follow him. And uh, I think the Bible says a third of the angels followed the devil. But he made things right in his house in heaven. Just like Joshua. When he said to the people of Israel, at that time he was the, he was the head of the nation. The way Joshua was talking to the people of Israel, because he was the head of the nation, that's the way men ought to be in their house, which I've told you before. The man is the head of the house. So he, it is the man's responsibility to have the house right with God. And the verse, like I said, Joshua twenty four fifteen, it says, But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And Christian men, they'll have that plaque somewhere in their house. For sure they ought to have it in their heart. As far as, far as me and my house, we will serve the Lord here. Just like God did it in heaven. Just like Joshua did it when he was, the head of, when, when he was over Israel. This is, he was talking to Israel when he said this. Now we go to chapter 26. Job comes back, in chapter 26, Job comes back with six questions. Verses 1 through 4, he has six questions. He says, how hast thou helped him... That is without power. What he's saying to them. What he's saying to his three friends. What motive did you have to help me? Or to help anyone? What motive do you have? He's saying was it to help or was it to hurt? Was it to give or to receive? Why do people help? Is what he's saying here. Why do people help others? Are we doing it because we want something? Are we doing it to be seen of men? Or are we doing it in God's love? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. It says, Every man's work shall be made manifest. Everything we do is going to be shown. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. It's saying the fire will show if your help was from the Lord or if it was just worthless. This is what he's saying here. Just like his three friends. Their help was worthless. Verse 14, If any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. <clears throat> he shall receive a reward. If your good work survive the fire, that's what it's saying, then you will receive a uh, reward. And I've already talked about that. When we get to heaven, there's going to be rewards for Christians. You know, if you just barely made it into the door, you got saved and, and you got into the door, but you didn't go further in, like y'all doing right now. Y'all just, just didn't get born again and that's it. Y'all here because y'all want to know more, right? This is what 
when you learn when you learn more and you do them then you're looking at rewards in heaven but there's a lot of people who get in the door but they stay right there you know that's all they want to know is that they they're they're make it to heaven they don't go no further but there is rewards in heaven verse 15 if any man's work shall be burned he shall suffer loss but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire if your if your works don't survive the fire he says then you will not receive a reward and there's a lot of christians born again christians are not going to have rewards in heaven and it says that they'll barely make it into heaven that's what i'm talking about they'll just barely make it they get in the door and that's it you understand what this saying here so when you do your good works when you do good deeds whatever it is it's given or whatever do it in secret that's what the lord says to do do it in secret now verse 2 of chapter 26 how savest thou the arm that hath no strength and verse 3 how hast thou counseled him that hath no wisdom what he's saying do you witness to the lost to help them do you witness to the lost to help them some religions okay they witness the lost people because they get points I'm going to mention it Jehovah Witnesses if they can leave you a watchtower or give you a watchtower they make points they they work their way to heaven if the Lord comes while they're alive what do you mean by points? Is that the kind they, of they make points they, they, to them you work your way to heaven that's why when they come to you they'll ask for a donation for the magazine but if you if you say well I ain't got no money they'll give it to you because they'll make so many points if they sell it to you but then they make they still make points if they give it to you but remember Jehovah Witnesses uh, is a cult and I don't mind saying this it's a, it's on my CD and if anybody listening to the CD has a question about it all you need to do is call me I know about Jehovah Witnesses I've studied them they believe that if you die right now you're just dead and later on in, in the teaching I'm gonna show about that but they believe you're just dead when you die unless you're the 144,000 and they believe that's gonna be Jehovah Witnesses they don't believe it's going to be Jews, like the Bible says. Aren't Jehovah Witnesses the ones that come knocking on the door and stuff? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I got so offended after I heard that one day or uh, one of the little pamphlets they got, but I got so offended that I couldn't. Yeah, they 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 go to door to door and and we not the Bible says if anybody comes to your house with another gospel, the Lord says not to let them in. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. In the tribulation time, of when it talks about the 144,000, the Bible says it's Jews. That's what the Bible says. But they're saying it's whoever is a Jehovah Witness. So Jehovah Witnesses who, who died during that time are going to go to heaven. But if you're a Jehovah Witness right now, and that, and that doesn't happen, it hasn't happened yet, then you're just dead. That's what they believe. You're just dead. And remember, they do not believe... Jesus is God. That's one thing you can recognize a cult on. That's the first thing to show you it's a cult. If they say Jesus is not God, it's a cult. Because there's no way you can be a born-again Christian and, and, and not believe that in the Trinity. There's, I mean, there's just no way. You have to believe in the Trinity to get born again. You have to believe that Jesus is God. And just like the teaching I had, I showed you without a doubt... Verses, I mean, I don't know how many verses I gave. I gave you tons of verses showing that Jesus is God. Well, also, the Jehovah Witnesses, they rewrite the Bible. Every so often, they rewrite it. Now, how can you live that way? How can, some, how can people believe, oh, well, we found a mistake, so we had to rewrite it? Well, the Mormons are a cult, too. They're a cult. And they, their commercials on TV are very deceiving. They seem like good Christian family. But the, but the Mormons, they carry the Bible. But they live off the Book of Mormons. They carry both of them. They got the Book of Mormons and the Bible. But they live out of the Book of Mormons. They just carry this for looks. To deceive you. Remember, the devil is a master of deception. Remember that. So anybody listening to CD, again, if you have any questions, my number's on the CD, just call me. Because I will back up what I say. I've learned it. You know, I have studied it. And I know what they believe. And there's no way. 
The Lord said, if you add or take away from this, woe unto you. When God says woe unto you, I suggest you better not do it. Verse 4. How hast thou plentifully declared the things as it is? Now this is something that we need. This is something that we need today in our churches. What he's saying here, this is mainly for preachers and teachers. Did they give us the whole truth of the Word of God? And we have preachers and teachers that don't. We have, there's churches out there, anything having to do neg- negatively, if it's not positive, they will not preach it. Is that preaching the whole Word of God? That's not preaching the whole Word of God. When you preach not to offend people, you're not preaching the Word of God. Because there's, remember, we are sinners. We need the Word of God. And when God corrects us on whatever we're doing, when He steps on our toes, hey, we're, we should say, thank you, Lord. I didn't know that. Thank you for showing me. But instead, people get offended. And there's pre- pre- preachers out there who will not, they do not want to offend the people. For two reasons. One, pride. They want a big church. Look how big my church is. Two, money. If I'm offending them, they're not going to give me money. Are, are these men of God? These are not men of God. And right here, it says in verse 4, Have you declared what the Word says? In verse 5, To whom hast thou uttered words? He's saying, Who did you speak to? In Luke chapter 4, verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He's right here. He said, Who have you said this to? Right here it tells you. You do it to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. People who are brokenhearted. That's who we need to go reach. To preach deliverance to the captives. People who are under the bondage of the devil, of sin. And the recovering of sight to the blind. And who's blind? Lost people are blind because what did the word say? The Bible says they're blind because the devil has made them blind. And right here it says to give them sight. Give them the Word of God. Open their eyes. To set at liberty them that are bruised. So who are we supposed to be uttering these words to? These people right here. The lost. Verse 6. Now here's the word we're going to talk about the spirits. Verse 6 says, Whose spirit came from thee? There's three kinds of spirits in the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? which is in you. So one spirit is the Holy Spirit, is the Lord, right? Because the Holy Spirit is Jesus, Jesus is God. So one spirit is the Holy Spirit, and He lives in you. And in Matthew 16, verse 14 through 17, it says, And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, they're talking to Jesus. Some, Eliza, and others, Jeremiah, are one of them the prophets. And He says unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Now listen, Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. So who's who? the Holy Spirit is Jesus, Jesus is God. So the Holy Spirit has revealed this to him. So there's, the Holy Spirit. Okay, we're talking about three different spirits now. We just I just showed you there's a Holy Spirit from the Lord. Now the Bible talks about unclean spirits. Revelation sixteen thirteen. And I saw three unclean spirits, <coughs> like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophets. So right here we see there's unclean spirits. There's the Holy Spirit. And there's unclean spirits. Matthew 16, 23, same thing. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Jesus had to tell Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, because at that time, an unclean spirit was in Simon Peter. Now remember, at this time, now when you receive the Holy Spirit, now this is after Jesus died on the cross and resurrected. After that, the Spirit lives in us now. Now before Jesus, before that, the, the, the Spirit only comes upon them. In the Old Testament and up until Jesus resurrected, from up until then, all through the Old Testament, up to then, 
The Holy Spirit only came upon them. Didn't come in them. Came upon them. But after Jesus, when Jesus said, I go so I can send you the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit lives in us. Okay, just like I, when I preached on, the, on the, the Holy Spirit. You have a Holy Spirit that's in you that you get when you're born again. When you get born again, the Lord puts the Holy Spirit in you. There's just the Spirit of man. 1 Corinthians 2.11 for what man knoweth the things of man, except the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. So what right here is saying, we have a spirit as a man, but our spirit as a man doesn't know the things of God. Only the spirit of God. So your spirit is not the Holy Spirit. Also in First Thess Thessalonians 5.23, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Lord right here is saying we do have a soul, we have a body, and we have a spirit. Man's spirit. Not Holy Spirit. Just the man's spirit. We have a spirit. Okay. So now we see there's three spirits. The Holy Spirit, unclean spirits, and just man's spirit. Now verses... 5 through 14, uh, that's Job just praising the Lord through those verses. <clears throat> Chapter 27, verse 1. More, now, I'm, I'm going to go verse by when I, I'm going to go through some verses here. Verse 1 on chapter 27. Moreover, Job continued his parable and said, and Job is continuing to say what he's been saying all along. This is what that's saying. As God liveth, who hath taken away my judgment, and the Almighty who hath vexed my soul. Job starts off with speaking highly of the Lord. Because he says, as God liveth. He knows his God is alive. Okay? He starts off great. He knows his God is alive. By saying he's a living God. But then he, support, then he starts speaking harshly of him. By saying he has denied Job justice. And that God has made him, made his soul bitter. Now Job's soul is bitter. You can tell by his complaints. His soul is, is bitter. But did God do that? Right here he's saying God did it. We know that God didn't do it. Verse 3. All the while my breath is in me and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. He's saying as long as I live, I will have the Spirit of God in me. So that's a good thing. He, know, he knows that's true. Verse 4. My lips shall not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. He's saying he will speak no evil and he'll tell no lies. And he's speaking about his innocence. Him being as all, everything that we've read up to here, Job is still claiming to be innocent. Verse 5. God forbid, forbid that I should justify you. Till I die, I will not remove my iniquity from, from me. He will never tell his friends that they are right. Till he dies, he's not going to say that, that the, his friends... That are saying that he's wicked. He's, he's not, he's not going to tell them that. He's not going to give in to them and say, okay, you're right. Till he dies, he's, he's going to proclaim his innocence. But, verse 6. Now this is, this is where Job goes down a little bit. Job says, my, that's the word my in there. The word my is very important. Job says, my righteousness I hold fast and I will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me so long as I live. What Job is saying here is that he's not wrong. So if he's not wrong, who's he saying is wrong? If he's saying he's being punished for no reason because he didn't do it, and God's the one punishing him, then who's wrong? That's what he's saying here. He's saying, my righteousness, I am I have done nothing wrong. My righteousness, I haven't done anything wrong. So if he hadn't done anything wrong, then it's got to be God. Now Job right here, listen, Job is speaking like the Jews believe. The Jews believe that way. That they're all right with God by the law, by keeping the law. Remember, the Jews are living by the law. Remember that. The Jews right now, today, are living by the law. By Moses' laws, by God's laws, they're living by those laws. We're living... By God's grace. Okay? We're living by His mercy. We're living by giving our life to the Lord. And He says it's not by works that you get saved. Remember that. It's just by obeying God. And in verse 8, 
It says, For what is the hope of the hypocrite? Though he had gained, when God taketh away his soul. Which is better explained in Matthew sixteen twenty six. It says, For what is a man pro- for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give to exchange for exchange excuse me, for what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? The Lord is saying, What is it what good is it gonna do you if you gain the whole world? Meaning you know, you have all the money you want. People love you. You're popular. You gain the whole world and you lose your own soul. What's the Bible say? To save your life, you have to lose it. These people don't want to lose it. These people don't want to lose their, their wealth. They don't want to lose their popularity. So because they don't want to lose that, they're going to end up losing their soul. Now Job is speaking about the wicked <clears throat> in the rest of this chapter, chapter 27. Okay, just bear with me. We'll, we'll get... We'll be finished in just a minute, okay? I usually quit around 8.30. Is that okay? Oh, yeah. Okay. Chapter 28. He's still continuing on his parable. And in these chapters, he's speaking about what is true wisdom. So Job is talking about what true wisdom is. Remember, these guys think they have wisdom. And he's told them, you don't have wisdom. So right here, he's talking about what true wisdom is. And in Proverbs 1.7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and their instructions. Fools. Who's the fools? Fools are people who don't believe this. Fools are the ones who think they have wisdom enough, they don't need this. That's what fools are. 1 Corinthians one twenty four. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. So our wisdom comes from who? From the Lord. If we have wisdom, spiritual wisdom, godly wisdom, it comes from the Lord. It's not because we're so smart or we're, we're intelligent. God gives you. God gives us our wisdom. All right? Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not, we can't get it the wisdom from the world. Because the Bible says the worldly wisdom is foolish. Our wisdom has to come from God to be, to be good wisdom. Like I said, you can take a guy who... Not very smart, not very intelligent, but he's born again. And then you take this other guy who's very intelligent, very, and doesn't have the Lord. Now, which one is smarter than the other? The one who recognizes who Jesus is. See, this guy over here, he's very intelligent, but he, he's so intelligent, he can't see who God is. He can't see who Jesus is. So who's got more wisdom? The one who can see God. First Corinthians one thirty, But of him... Are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness, sanctification and redemption. Like I said, He's given us the wisdom. Proverbs 8.11 For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things they may desire are not to be compared to it. So there's nothing to be compared to God's wisdom. So if we are living by the Word of God, He's given us the wisdom also. And there's nothing to be compared to us when we know the Word of God. This is the most, that commercial that says priceless, this is what's priceless. You hear me? The Bible is what's priceless. In chapter uh, chapter 29, Job talks about himself and what godly man he was. And he was a godly man, and he talks about how he was a judge of the people. Remember, people used to come to him at the beginning of the, uh, the book. People used to come to him and used to give him strength from the Lord to help him out. <clears throat> so he's talking about his former glory in chapter 29, the way it used to be. Then in chapter 30, now, he, now <clears throat> he's going to talk about where he is now, how bad it is for him. So ch- chapter 30 is talking about now, what's happening now and how bad it is for him. And then we go to chapter 31, Job is going to justify himself and prove that he's not guilty. Job is going to show that he wasn't just righteous on the outside like the religious leaders. What did the Lord, what did Jesus say about the religious leaders? That they were clean on the outside, but they were empty, dirty on the inside. And Job says, I'm going to show you I'm not just clean, righteous on the inside. I'm going to show you I'm righteous. I mean, 
on the outside, I'm going to show you I'm righteous on the inside also. That's what chapter 31 is talking about. In verses 1 through 4 of chapter 31, Job says one of the sins he's not going to do is lust. He says, I'm going to keep my eyes from lusting. Now, why he pointed that out? He's shown physically his eyes, and he's going to also show he's right from the heart. He keeps his heart, he says he keeps his heart pure by guarding his eyes. And we as men, we have to guard our eyes to keep our heart pure. Now, women, you don't know what I'm talking about, but men do. And let me just say this. I said it before. I don't know if you remember. Men, God made us to get excited over a woman's body. God made us this way. But that woman's body is only supposed to be our wife. The only body we should see is our wife. Okay? Because He made us this way. He made us to get excited over a a woman's body. But the way the world is today, they're showing their body. And now we have the temptation to look. But as Christians, as soon as we see, we need to turn. As Christian men, we need to turn away quick. Because that is a temptation. Because God made us this way. It's not a sin. Because He made us this way. But He didn't make it for women to be going around town in bikinis showing all their body. Or in shirt, mini skirts. Or in blouses down down to here. So now we got to fight that. Alright? We do. We have to fight that. And I'll just point that out to you. We have to guard our eyes. Men, we have to guard our eyes. Because if we guard our eyes, then we're helping our heart. Just because God made us that way, that doesn't mean we can just go around looking. Because, well, He made me that way. No, He made us that way. But that was the only to look at our wife that way. He knows every step I take, he says. He sees everything I do. That's what Job says. Is that true? Is there anything we can do that God cannot see? So if you're somewhere and you're doing something and your pastor walks in and you and you try to oh oh and you try to hide it, why are you hiding it from the pastor? If you can't hide it from God, why are you trying to hide it from a man? You hear me what I'm saying? What's more important? Oh, it's okay if God sees me, but I don't want my pastor to see me. There's people like that. They'll, get, they'll do that. If the pastor comes along, they ride away, whatever it is, oh, oh and, and hide it. But right here, God sees everything. If God sees it, what the heck are you caring about if a man sees you doing it? Or whatever it is. Okay? You understand what I'm saying? He's saying any false steps of sin, God takes notice of them. He takes more notice of our sin than, than we do. Because how many times, and be truthful with yourself, how many times have we done something? Oh, it's just a little sin. Is there a little sin to God? No. But how many times have we said that? Oh, it's just, we make it seem small. God notices more than we do because we kind of, oh, it's just, they're not, oh, just to God. Sin is sin. He knows that God can bring misery to Him for doing these sins. God chastises us when we, when we mess up. He spanks us. The Bible talks about it. He does spank us. And why did He spank us? Why did your parents spank you when you were growing up? Because they love you. you know, our Lord loves us and He spanks us. And I know He spanks because, believe me, I've been spanked before. More than once. It's not nice. But I had it coming. Verses 5 through 23 Now Job is saying, If I've lied or deceived, let God check my heart and know that I'm I'm, I'm innocent. If I've gotten off of God, off of God's will, if I've sinned with my heart because of my eyes, talking about lust again, and because of any other sin, he's saying, Lord, he that the Lord should punish him. He said, "If If I've done any of this, then I deserve being chastised. This is what he's saying. And he's saying he's willing to give up anything that he sent on. Like, like uh, earlier, it says that he got all his land because he stole it from people. And he's saying, if I've done that, Lord, then let them sow what I, let them weep what I sowed. If I stole that land and all the crops that I put out there, instead of it coming to me, let it go to the others. This is what he's saying. If I've done that, he's saying. If I've done that, then do this. This is what Job was saying. And if I'm guilty, 
and mention other sins, how could he face God? If he's guilty of all these things his friends say he's guilty of, he's saying, how can I face God? If I'm guilty of all this stuff, if, he, in that chapter he keeps saying, if I've done it. If I've done it. So in the last part he says, if I did all this, how can I face God? Then verses 24 to 34, then he talks about if he'd done any of these other sins. Then he talks about other sins. And, and one of them is making money and having wealth. He said, if I've made money and wealth my happiness, then he's not looking to God for his happiness, right? If he's looking for money and wealth to make him happy, is he looking to the Lord for happiness? No, you can't. If your eyes are over here on this, and this is what makes you happy, how can your eyes be over here? So he's saying, if I've done this, and he said, also, if I've worshipped the moon and the sun, then I'm denying you. He said, if I've worshipped the moon and the sun, then I'm denying you. This is what he says. So if our eyes are, are anything else but the Lord, we're denying Him as being God. If our happiness comes from anything else but the Lord, and like I've said before, if you are looking to your spouse for happiness, your spouse will let you down. Your spouse will, but God won't. If you want happiness, true happiness, happiness that's going to last, look to the Lord for happiness. And when you look to the Lord for happiness, then all this other stuff is going to fall in place. Your happiness has to come from Him. Because if you're expecting your spouse to make you happy, believe me, you will be disappointed. I'm not saying you're going to divorce them or anything. I'm just going to say, don't depend on another person for your happiness. you got to depend on God to bring happiness to you. Because He's the only one who can really bring true happiness to you. He said, if I've enjoyed evil coming upon my enemies, like I said a while ago, we shouldn't, we shouldn't wish that a person go to hell because he's done this to us or he's done that to us. We shouldn't say, man, I, I hope he goes to hell. He's saying right here, if I've done that, I'm wrong. Now remember, all this, he said, if I've done it. So he's saying, if I've done any of this, Lord, I deserve what I'm getting. I deserve what I'm getting. But Job knows he hasn't done anything. Because like I said, he's a man of God. There was none better than, uh, there was no man better than him in the East. That's what was at the very beginning of the chapter uh, the, of the book. That's what it said about Job. But he said, if I, if I have done any of this, then I should be getting what I, all this that I'm getting. He's saying, have I ever tried to hide my sins like Adam? See, they were naked, right? But when they took up the fruit and God came looking for them in the garden, what did Adam do? He used a fig leaf to cover himself. How did he knew he was naked? Because as soon as he sinned, as soon as he sinned, he was no longer pure. See, before that happened, before they ate the fruit, they were naked. Did they look at each other like, you know, no. There was nothing wrong with it. But as soon as they took of the fruit, and they had sin in their life. Now, now they can see. And that's why Adam got a fig leaf to cover himself. And that's another story. I'm not going to get into that, but that's a good story though. And he says in this chapter, he says, these sins shouldn't go unpunished. Okay, that's what Job is saying. He said, if I did any of these sins, I would be afraid to come out of my house. That's what Job's saying. If I, if I did any of these sins, I would be afraid to come out of my house. That's what Job says. And in verses 34 through 40, he said, If only someone would hear him, his wishes are that God would answer him. His, his wishes that his enemies would put into writing their, change, their, their uh, charges of sin against him. He says that he would carry these charges on his back. And this is what the Jews did back then. If they had sin or they had charges against them, they had to carry him on that back so other people could see. So now we see why Jesus carried a cross on his back and his charges was what? He, the, the, the religious leaders were, were saying he's proclaiming to be king. So that's the charges they put on his back on the cross. They got that because that's what they did. So that's what they did to Jesus. This is what they accused him of, so that's what they put on the cross. And he had to carry it on his back. But that's why he said this right here in this chapter, in these verses. 
just like they did with Jesus. But they did that. He said, if they do that, then I can explain to them exactly, exactly what I've done and why. He says, if they do that to me, if they were to do this to me, then I, when they question me about it, then I could tell them. But this is what he, he was just saying. You know, I wish they would do that to me. So when people come up to me and say, you did this or you did that, that's on your back, he can explain to them. And that's why he's saying he wished that they would do that to him. But we've learned tonight why they had the saying on the cross. Because this is what they did.